game. I mean, black and white for some reason. I've been clicking buttons. Well, why not? Uh, I was asked uh, a little while ago. Well, I've been asked to do a few things, but I was asked a little while ago why I feature so many Commodore products when there are so many other manufacturers, or there were so many other manufacturers about in that era. Well, simply, when I was a kid, the computer industry was just starting out. Um, the home computer scene hadn't really taken off as such, not in the UK or Europe. In America, they had the Apple II quite early on, but in the UK, we didn't really, we didn't really get anything until the Sinclair appeared, uh, or the Sinclair machines rather appeared. But um, yeah, when I was a kid, there wasn't really much about. But I do remember seeing computers in films on TV, and they were sort of magical, wonderful things that could do that could do anything. You could start a nuclear war by uh, just replying to the question, "Do you want to play a game?" Uh, you could uh, perhaps drive down a road in a time machine at 88 miles an hour, all done by computer. But that really wasn't going to be a uh, an issue for a kid on a council estate in 1983. But these were all dreams, aspirations. Computers promised to change the world in a way that nobody could foresee, I don't think, in 19, 1982-83. Just by flicking a power switch and a screen coming to life and a ready prompt flashing. Uh, it, if you had a Sinclair machine, it would flash a K. If you had a Commodore machine, it would be a block. But whatever it was, that cursor, as soon as that cursor flashed, you could do anything. You could go anywhere, you could be anything. If you could type or code, you could be anything. If you had a disc in your hand or a cassette, then you're set. We're going to reach for a cassette then, but I don't have one in hand. Um, but the problem is, in the early 1980s, computers cost a lot of money. The home computers were still expensive. Um, generally speaking, the computers that were about in that early era were the DIY soldier it yourself, or they were machines from the likes of Acorn, Atari, or Texas Instruments. Commodore hadn't really infiltrated the UK just yet, although they were starting to. Uh, machines were expensive. Texas Instruments machines cost a fortune, TI-99. Acorn machines were expensive. Everything was expensive. Uh, until Sir Clive Sinclair appeared, and he brought with us, with him um, the ZX-80, which was, I think, £69 when it was re uh, released in 1980. God awful thing. Black and white, no sound, 1K. Poor basic, poor everything. Awful, awful thing. Uh, when you pressed a key, the screen went blank. Then we had the ZX81, which was a mild improvement. Had a, oh, the case used to bend. It was made out of um, as to carrier bags, I think. But the ZX81 was um, a much better machine, in so much as it went from being awful to just being quite poor, um, which was. Uh, a little bit of a trademark for Sinclair in those days. But uh, the ZX81 sort of changed things around a bit. Suddenly you could buy a computer for less than £100 that almost did something, although not much. It was a glorified calculator that you plugged into a television set. This has got nothing to do with Commodore, but I'm building up to it. Bear with me. Um, the biggest breakthrough probably in this bleak era of 1982-83 was, for all the wrong reasons, Texas Instruments. Now, Texas Instruments launched the TI-99 in 1979. Uh, they revised it and released it as the 4A, I think in 1980, 81, whatever it was. And uh, it was a very expensive machine to produce. It for all kinds of reasons, there is a whole story of the TI-99, which I might go into 
Uh, I should really, in my first computer I ever used a T99, I should go into great length and tell you all about it having the wrong processor and all kinds of things. But um, the TI-99, what they did, or Tix Instruments, what they did in 1983, they abandoned the TI-99, withdrew from the market, stopped manufacturing, and basically dumped all the hardware onto the market. All the resellers, all the warehouses, get rid of it. And what this meant was the TI-99, which, which was at one point selling for, I think, 199, had been sold off for 50 quid. So all the second hand machines that were in the paper then for hundred pounds suddenly dropped down to about twenty. So my first home computer was a TI ninety nine four A, which was a year old, and we my mum paid thirty pounds for it. It came with a bag of games, some modules, Parsec, Alpine, that sort of thing. Plug it into your TV, turn it on, away you go. I loved it. I thought it was great. Until I went to school and said, Oh I've got the TI ninety nine. Was high. Nobody knew, knew what it was. Nobody had ever heard of it. They'd seen the old advert, but nah. If you bought a gaming magazine, you'd see Sinclair, Vic 20, um, Atari. There'd be no TI 99. Nobody was interested. The a market abandoned it as quickly as TI abandoned it. So it was an orphaned machine. That's why I got it cheap. So my enthusiasm quickly drained. And I was listening to my Spectrum owning friends talking about Jetpack, Jet Set Willy, Technician Ted, Turmoil, Trash Man, all those kinds of things. And I thought, I want to play those. Another friend who lived opposite me had the Acorn Electron, so this must have been 84. He just got it brand new that Christmas. So perhaps it was February 84. Um, and he had Chucky Egg. I wanted to play Chucky Egg, but I couldn't because I had a TI-99. So the TI-99 was sold, or given away to my niece. I had two TI-99s for some reason at one point. One was given away, one was sold. Um, and I bought a Sinclair Spectrum. It was a Sinclair Spectrum Plus, 48K. And I thought it was awesome, brilliant. I could share games with my friends, and we were playing things like... Uh, the Hobbit, um, although no, none of us knew what the story was, we didn't know Tolkien, we didn't know anything, but we were playing Hobbit with absolutely no clue what to do. But we played all kinds of things, Ace, Ace 2, Damn Busters, uh, Spy Hunter, all kinds of things. Great times, great times. But there were some issues. Two or three people in class had one of these fancy Commodore machines and they were sniggering. Sinclair Spectrum, 48k, colour clash, no sound, oh dear oh dear. Um, so once again I was disappointed and then I'd read the magazines and you'd have reviews of a Sinclair version of a game and then there'd be pictures of the C64 version and they'd be going on about the wonderful sound and blah 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 and you buy the Spectrum one and it used to be monochrome a green screen or something black pixels and the music could be a beep or a boop or a bloody stupid scratchy noise or a silly tune some of the tunes were good don't get me wrong some of the sound effects were fantastic but generally speaking they were awful so I decided I need a Commodore 64. So mum was shouted again, bless her, and she bought me a Commodore 64. This was the last machine she directly ever bought me because I was uh, a teenager then. So I had a Commodore 64 with two bags of games. I went into this guy's house and uh, he had the Commodore 64 um, the bread bin brown one and it had three or four disk drives stacked on each other all connected together and he had a stack of disk boxes um, as high as his TV and the TV was probably a 14 inch color TV but that was what was connected to the C64 
So he copied loads of stuff to to Bert Smith's C15 cassette tapes, shoved them in the bag. So when I got there, there was two big carrier bags full of games. If you need any more games, come back and see me. I've got them all, he said. Never went back. Um, so I now have it at C64. Plugged it in at home. Oh, he did t tell me, he said, have you ever used one before? No. Run, stop, load games. Was it shift, run, run, stop? Can't remember. Um, to load cassette games. Didn't have a disk drive. So I played whatever it was, Marble Madness, Spy Hunter with music, music all the way through, um, adventure games. I used to love adventure games on the 64 and graphic adventure, graphic arcade and graphic action games. Um, you'd have things like V or the Desert Rats or, or any number of things. And it was wonderful. The music was fantastic. I loved it. I used to play games just to listen to the loading tunes. Not interested in the game, just play the loading tune. Marvellous. Wonderful. And that was Commodore. And then we had the Commodore magazine, Zap64. Commodore user, Commodore International. And many others. When you walked into a news agent in the 1980s, you'd have popular car mechanics, the cookbooks, microwave know-how, all that sort of thing. And then there would be Zap 64, Crash, Commodore user, Commodore International, and various other stuff. PC and Acorn user, all that sort of thing. CPC user. Um, but the C64 was everywhere. The adverse at Christmas. Boost the Chemist. The Terminator 2 action pack. Uh, the James Bond action pack came later. And it just never ended. It was an endless stream of Commodore advertising or advertising of Commodore products. The Commodore was everywhere, whether it be the C64 or later the Amiga. Uh, now, as soon as I got the 64, I realized it was a better quality machine than the Spectrum. Everything about it was better. Um, and the 64 served me until I saw an advert for the Commodore 128D with a separate keyboard and that was the first time I'd ever seen or taken notice of a computer with a separate keyboard and I thought that looks like a proper machine rather than a kid's toy I want one of those but obviously I didn't get one but uh, what I did see in a magazine a little while later I don't remember which magazine it was but they had the uh, Amiga feature and it was a feature on the upcoming Amiga 500 which hadn't been launched yet or it was just being launched in the States but Europe had not seen it yet and they had a picture of it I don't know if it was a mock-up or the real one it was telling you about all the games and all the stuff it could do speech, audio, studio quality sound Make your own songs, make your own videos, make your own tea, you can do everything. And this thing was 599, I think it was, UK pounds. And I saw this and thought, that's the machine for me. Because it had with it, when you turn the page over, a big spread of Defender of the Crown in full colour. And it looked like a photo from a film to me. And I was blown away, blown away. It was wonderful most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Clearly made an impression on me um, because uh, it sticks with me now, 30 years later. So that was the Commodore Amiga. So this is why I feature lots of Commodore equipment because Commodore to me was always a class act. It was always the better quality machine. It was always the machine that everybody wanted. Don't get me wrong, the Sinclair stuff was very good in its own way as was the Acorn, the Amstrad all of them, they all had their assets they all had their good features but Commodore to me had it all or most if not all there are issues with the Commodore 64, lots of brown colours slow loading, all kinds of things 
But um, to me, Commodore was the machine to aspire to, the machine you wanted, the machine that could do anything and everything. Even at the Amiga 500's um, height, when it was fighting the Atari ST, uh, a girlfriend had an Atari ST. Um, uh, and I used it a few times. Didn't like it very much. It had uh, very clicky audio that sounded tinny, wasn't nice. When you played the Commodore Amiga, you put Lost Patrol on, or Prince of Persia, or whatever game it might be. The CD, uh, the uh, Amiga had wonderful sound. So again, it just reinforced my view that Commodore was the best. And there was no comparison, as incorrect as that may be. But this was the late 1980s. And let's face it, from the late 1980s up to 92 or so, Commodore could do very little wrong. They owned the 16-bit market, and they were still clinging on to the 8-bit market. They were everywhere. It wasn't until I saw Warcraft and then... No, before that, what did I see before? Star Wars thing. A Rebel Assault on CD. On CD-ROM by LucasArts. And I thought, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. It's got a video. I don't know where I saw it. it probably at Leeds Computer Centre. It was probably playing on a machine when I went in there. That was the first time. Well, Leeds Computer Centre was a, a computer shop. A DIY enthusiast shop. Where you bought RAM and motherboards and hard drives and stuff. We used to go in there. It was big. It was open plan with a counter at one end. And they, one of my vivid memories of it is going in there to buy probably a 486 motherboard some years later. And they had a big stack of tape drives and an advert on the back of it, on the, on the back wall, saying um, DDR memory is the future. Forget about it, 72 pin sims, DDR, that's what you need. Didn't know what DDR was, no idea, I've never heard of that before. And this was way before DDR became uh, mainstream. I think Lee's Computer Center was run by serious enthusiasts. It had Amiga stuff, it had ST stuff, it had PC stuff. Um, but I don't remember going in there to buy any Amiga stuff. No, I don't. So it must have been when I bought my 386 PC with Craig, my friend. We went to somewhere to buy it. Sheffield Leeds or somewhere and he gave us uh, or gave me a free apricot might have been a 286 or something with a, uh, an orange screen I used that for about a week and it went in the bin I wish I kept it there um, but uh, up to the PC or the 486 386 you, and the Commodore could do no wrong. So that is why I feature Commodore. To me, it is the company that provided dreams and inspirations. So that is it, really. This is why I do lots of stuff on the Commodore. Rightly or wrongly, Atari users will slag me off and say, Atari is better. The PC Brigade will slag me off and say, the Commodore is rubbish. If they're any good, they're still be in business. And the Apple lot, well, they just live in cloud cuckoo land anyway. Having said that, most of my gear is Apple. Um, so this is why I record and do lots with Commodore. And long may I continue. I will do lots more of Commodore stuff. With lots of videos to come. I hope you find them enjoying, not too boring. Um, but that's it for now. I'm going to have something to eat. Thank you, and I'll see you later.